Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Ben Katkin, uh, and I'm a professor of urbanism here in the Bartlett. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this event. Oh, I should probably turn this on. That might help. Um, Uh, sorry about the slight delay. Um, we're going to make a start, but just to warn you, we might have to do a switch over with a particular uh, lead that we're using um, in between my introduction and uh, the lecture this evening. So I'm really delighted to welcome you all here in the room and also uh, everyone online. I hope that you can uh, see and hear us clearly uh, to this Queering Urbanism lecture, which is going to be given by Professor Vanessa Castambrotto, who's Professor of Climate Urbanism at the Urban Institute and Department of Geography at the University of Sheffield. So welcome particularly to Vanessa. Um, so this series was initiated by Be Queer, which is the Bartlett's LGBTQ plus network for staff, students and uh, allies. And I'd like to introduce my, one of my collaborators on this series, he's Giordana Romaglio, who uh, is Associate Professor of, uh, in the Development Planning uh, Unit of uh, Professor, Associate Professor of Planning for Diversity. And also we have Tim Waterman in the room who ran our last event. Uh, and I should also just mention um, Lo Marshall, who's really helped to set up today's event and the series as a whole. He's Senior Research Fellow in Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in the Built Environment in the Bartlett, uh, but who sadly can't be with us tonight. And also Say Mali, who is a PhD student who's studying queer practices of placemaking here at the Bartlett. And so we've all collaborated on this series um, and uh, it's, it, are all enjoying, I think, how it's uh, gaining momentum and uh, and evolving perhaps slowly, but um, with lots of different interesting events. So our past events, the last one which Tim convened with Sarah Enzer uh, was on queer futurity. I think there'll be some interesting connections to tonight's talk. And all of our past events, just to point out, are on our webpage now. So if you search for Be Queer at the Bartlett, you fi you'll find all of the archive of the previous events. And this was important to us because we wanted it to be a free a uh, public series that was accessible as possible, which is why we're doing the events hybrid. So just to say something a little bit about our intentions with this series, we wanted to draw connections between queer and trans studies and urban studies and urban practice. So our aim was to provide a sustained space for making those connections on queer inclusive urbanisms and to bring forward speakers and evidence from a diversity of different contexts. We're interested in exploring how theoretical and methodological invention from queer and trans studies and activism can inform or could inform urban studies and urbanism. And I'm sure as many of you are aware, there's a long history of geographies of sexuality back to the 1960s even. But I think today, mediated by technology, there's a resurgence of interest in questions of queer space and place and a globalized queer activism, uh, even of course, while issues around sexual and gender diversity have to be understood in relation to particular contexts. And the terms themselves and patterns of scholarship are rightly subjected to decolonial scrutiny. So we very much wanted to address these kinds of complexities in this series. Um, we're really excited to be able to learn from Vanessa's work tonight, which we know to be really rich and rigorous and experimental with regard to these issues. So before I introduce Vanessa, I just wanted to explain the format for today. So this is a hybrid event. Um, we will have uh, the talk and then some time for Q&A uh, from people in the room, but also online. So if you do have a question, I think you should be able to post that into the chat and we'll pick that up. Um, just a bit of housekeeping for those that are in the room. We're not expecting a fire drill. So if the alarm goes off, then please leave through one of the nearest fire exits. Um, there's one on either side of you. Uh, uh, and the event is being recorded, as you will have heard from the machine just now. Um, so with that out of the way, I'd really like to now turn to our talk and to introduce Vanessa, who I'm sure uh, many of you know, as she used to be based at the, the Bartlett in the Development Planning Unit, but also through her work. 
Um, so Vanessa is Professor of Climate Urbanism uh, and her research brings queer and feminist neo-materialist thinking and participatory approaches to planning into dialogue with three key themes, the government of climate change in urban areas, urbanization and the dynamics of energy transitions and barriers to the implementation of climate change action. And in addition to her academic publications, Vanessa has made direct contributions to international policy, including the UN Habitats 2016 World Cities Report. And on a personal note, I wanted to mention the excellent article that Vanessa has recently published on queering participatory planning and recommend that you read it if you haven't already, which outlines some of the barriers, but also potentials to queer approaches in international development planning, which I think has a wider relevance for any of us working in built environment disciplines or urban disciplines. So Vanessa's talk today titled Thinking Climate Change Through Queer Ideas of Time promises to extend the themes of our last event, where there was a discussion around queer, linking queer models of time and space with climate crisis and activism. Um, and I'm really excited to now welcome and hand over to Vanessa um, and uh, uh, look forward to the discussion afterwards. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. You say it's always so nerve wracking. Honestly, I, I mean, I, I wonder one thing, uh, when am I going to stop getting nervous? I don't even remember my pass my password. But yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Jordan and Ben, and all the other colleagues in the network and uh, team. Thank you for thinking of me as a contributor to this exciting lecture series. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm a bit uh, uh, worried that you think you can learn from me because I thought I was going to learn by coming and meeting you. So I hope you will be inviting me to future lectures. Uh, I thought my presentation was here. Do I have to share it? Just like that? Okay, there we are. I'm gonna share it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was I was saying to Jordana that uh, my dear friend uh, Richard Lorch, who actually edits Building Third Cities, which is a very nice journal, uh, he always says it is a little miracle when technological things seem to work as you expected them. So whenever you're ready, Thanks, Jordana. Okay, lovely. Good in climate urbanism. So as you can see, whenever you prepare a talk, often you try to say more things than you pretended to say. I, I wanted only to talk about, about uh, time, but then it kind of expanded a little bit when I was writing it. And in fact, I wanted to, to start with saying all my work starts from the observation of the complex relationship between urbanization and climate change, right? So whether this is in terms of how their impacts interact or how they influence human narratives about how to inhabit the world, the relationship between these two is rather complex and fascinating from a research point of view. You have some examples from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So this is the reason why since, during the last seven years, which is the time since I joined the Urban Institute in Sheffield, uh, I have developed a research program on what I call climate urbanism. And um, what is climate urbanism? So climate urbanism really is simply an hypothesis the idea that climate change represents a new epoch in the way we think about cities. And here I've been influenced particularly by urbanist Eugene McCann that differentiates this idea of urbanization from that of urbanism. So urbanism is a term that enables engagement with different ways of thinking across urban, uh, 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 to think in the urban across time. Something that enables moving away from one dimensional analysis of urban change that often follow the notion of urbanization. So if urbanism refers to the different stages of change in modes of inhabitation, and particularly different ways in which we think that form of inhabitation, then climate urbanism is the moment in which that change becomes explained by climate change. So there are three ways, as you see in that slide, in which climate change is refashioning or engaging the urban environment. So the first one uh, at the right of the slide is practical. Climate change calls for responses for, uh, for mitigation and adaptation 
and the urban is increasingly perceived. As the place where those solutions can be effective. What's that? Climate change has motivated changes in the city that have exacerbated the dynamics of a spatial difference, uh, which were already at play, thus creating new forms of spatial injustice. And the third one is existential. Climate change is an existential challenge that has transformed our understanding of ourselves as inhabiting species, and hence the urban as a notion of inhabitation. So our own being in the world has become transformed beyond recognition. So the, the climate urbanism literature has particularly explored that second form of engagement critical, but uh, sometimes that research becomes a little bit stale because we end up criticizing all the actions we do for climate change and we it's like a circle, like nothing that we do is ever going to help. So I think studying the other two forms of climate urbanism is also essential. So this is what I think climate urbanism is. But if we think about queer in climate urbanism, then uh, we have to ask, uh, where does the queer fit in climate urbanism? When I tell people that I'm interested in this, most people like put a surprise face. And also I could perhaps start by saying that the queer uh, resists any fitting to anything, and that's what makes it wonderful. But nevertheless, I would like to justify my engagement with queer theory as a means to develop further new creative agendas of climate urbanism. Yes, uh, they're not connecting with things that are connected. We tell you to Yeah. So this is the queer materiality of technological infrastructures. It's not working? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Vanessa, sorry. Yeah, so uh, we think of the queer in relation to urbanism, right? If we think queer urbanism in relation to a series of issues, maybe related to land, housing, planning, infrastructure. For me, inhabitation is like the term that lands all this into something. So I think when we think about that, a key observation is like as Petra Doan, uh, uh, our queer planner has explained, the queer constitutes a new frontier of exclusion in which affected individuals are constructed as undeserving, deviant, and abject in ways that generate multiple forms of intended and unintended discrimination. So this is clearly one concern for climate urbanism because there are indeed mechanisms whereby the new responses given to climate change have differentiated impacts on populations that identify themselves as queer. For example, informal settlements are particularly sensitive to climate change impacts, such as flooding or heat waves. People who belong to LGBTIQ plus collectives tend to be overrepresented in informal settlements, as uh, geographer Andrew Tucker and, and colleagues have persuasively shown. Moreover, LGBTIQ plus collectives may be unable to access personal and institutional resources, for example, those grounded on institutions such as the family, which could help them cope with the impacts of climate change. So that more traditional way of thinking about uh, the queer as, as a mechanism for exclusion is important for climate urbanism, particularly within the second strand of research on climate urbanism. However, this is not the only reason why I am exploring the relevance of queer thought to understand this. My proposition is that queer theory offers unique conceptual tools to approach some of the dilemmas raised by climate urbanism and the need to explore structures of inhabitation that shape contemporary urban lives in a changing climate. And in particular, I think we need a shift of perspective on spatial justice that not only recognizes queer experiences, but also first the means to change them alongside experiences of everybody else. 
So I find uh, a lot of inspiration on the queer utopianism of Jose Esteban Muñoz, and particularly the call for transformations of societies shaped by heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, and imperialism. So if we want to respond to climate change, this is what we have to do, right? So it's not that far. Queer theory helps to move away from discourses that want to be transformative, but only reproduce, reproduce the status quo, and focus instead on the revolutionary character of very minor mundane interactions, positions, and affections. Yeah, no, it's not going. Next one, where are you ladies? Okay. So the only the other the other thing that the queer does, the queer theory does, is to put the normal under examination. And this is not just gender assumptions, it is the whole gamut of normalized assumptions that becomes under question. So for example, in my work, I have engaged with messiness, the notion of messiness to challenge these rationalities that become normalized in the governance of climate change. For example, in an essay before the pandemic, I wrote this, if we think of mess as a point of access to deliver change, then we find action that emerges at the intersection of messy interactions between strategy, knowledge, and bodies. So all that is the, the pretended normality of these aspects, strategies, knowledge, and bodies, all that should be put under examination. So for me, embracing messiness is a means to contest the illusions of a structure and control that permeate current climate policy, and perhaps also climate activism. In a sense, when, when I started thinking about messiness, which was much long before I started to even read queer theory, I was already flirting with it, with the need to redefine our lives in the actual existing world, no matter how aggressive this world is to us, to our bodies and to our lives, as uh, the cultural theorist Yves Kosovsky said, we explain in her work. So this is really a world in which we have already failed to create order. We have failed to control the climate change but is that what we want to say? Is that what we want to do? And here again, queer theory is coming to think to us, maybe we have to think what failure means as Jack Halberstam will have done. Perhaps that failure to actually solve climate change is our refusal to live in a world ruled by fossil fuels. So by embracing the actual existing world, its love and its suffering, we are actually moving forward in rethinking our actions to deal with climate change. So, uh, I'm going to focus on the theory of climate change and particularly what it says about that the question, the existential question of climate urbanism. And for that, I want to talk about two different ideas. And here, I don't know if I will have time. Well, because we will, you tell me when I have to stop and I will. Um, so there are these two areas that I want to talk about. One is desire and the other one is time. And when I originally wrote the abstract, I thought I would only talk about time, but then I felt that the two came together. So a lot of current urbanism is driven by implicit conceptualizations of these both concepts, desire and time, but none of them really is theorized in any proper way. And, uh, and yeah, so particularly how it affects uh, climate politics. So when we think about interrogating the nature of a climate desires, it's like, who can make justice to that? But let's assume that desire is simply a form of belief in a referential object that the subject, uh, the individual feels is lacking. It's an object that would make them feel whole or complete or something that they, they want. So is desires that search for that lost object is rel related to an object, uh, to an absence to an absence. In climate change debates, uh, desire is seen as being driven by consumerism, as a constant commitment in our societies to commodification, whether this is explicit or implicit within our practices. This construction of the environmental problem as a problem of desire is behind many of the environmental prescriptions, for example, the carbon diet prescriptions that characterize environmental footprinting that really dominate demand side approaches to climate change action. So they are based on ac restric restricting access to the consumerism goods that supposedly make us happy. So in this narrative, we can construct climate change as the ultimate fulfillment of what Lauren Berlin has called cruel optimism, the kind of attachments that prevent our flourishing. 
attachment to consumer products has created the ultimate autodestructive dysfunctional self. Such attachments under capitalism are not restricted to individual desires, but they are also part of a collective desire for an industrial society that provides security through the provision of labor, uh, as we see, for example, in protests of mining communities uh, and other collectives that refuse to leave coal and other fossil fuels behind. And more recently, perhaps also our own prime minister giving a no loving note to fossil fuel companies, as you may all know. So I personally have some sympathy for this diagnosis. Uh, and in the book, uh, The Muslim at the End of the World, Anna Singh explains how modification occurs when the entanglements of humans and ecologies become broken. So when you separate things from the environment, then you make them consumable. And after that disentanglement, those consumer products come to feel our environmental, uh, the gap of our environmental guilt, guilt, even if they don't play any kind of fun fundamental or meaningful role in our existence. However, I am also, I have that sympathy, but at the same time, I'm very wary of this because this diagnosis leads to a prescription of scarcity and restriction and the control of desire as a means to intervene in environmental action. So this control can be individual, such as in carbon footprinted models, and that leads to calculation and self-regulation. Uh, everybody can do their bits, but I think this is failing to see the ways we can intervene in the climate change. Instead, perhaps uh, I've argued uh, to think about ideas of abundance in terms of our climate action. So what prescriptions fail of, for scarcity fail to recognize is that the way we desire is uh, produced via a standing object which effectively locates desire elsewhere. So it's something, it's always something else. And I, like uh, an example that I really like is, for example, when in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we suddenly were all looking for toilet paper in, in empty stores, stores of toilet paper. And we were very concerned of never go a day without whipping our bottoms in comfort. I mean, but we all know we cannot live without toilet paper. It's not that toilet paper is particularly central to anybody's life, right? We can wash with water or whatever. So what desire can possibly explain the panic buying that we saw during the lockdown? So the toilet paper actually stands for the need to do something in response to a crisis. We do not want toilet paper particularly. We want to feel that we did enough to protect ourselves and to protect our loved ones. So that's the question now, what to do to protect ourselves in the context of climate change. So the question is not how to restrict our desire for consumerism, but how to recover our sense of individual and collective agency in a world that seems to go ahead without ourselves. So back, so I think I would follow the reasoning of Anna Singh to his conclusion. The challenge is the breakdown of entanglements that would provide for us that sense of security. And such breakdown is manifest in a sense of lack of neighborly support and isolation. So the toilet roll during the pandemic stood for that rupture of our social connections. Producing a community requires not only taking that product away from its environment, but also breaking the whole landscape of social relations and social support networks to create the effects that eventually translate into this unbridled desire in which toilet paper becomes such an important thing. So perhaps this forces us to think how desire is informing our notions of environmentalism and environmental action. So Jane Seymour is a queer, theor a queer theorist. Uh, she's been doing work on bad environmentalism pointing out the shame, actually shame of all the, is the central effect in contemporary environmentalism. And Seymour indeed questions whether this is the right way to perform environmentalism, a way that shows in virtuous acts of self-control, such as veganism or changing our traveling patterns and then tell everybody about it. On the one hand, those acts of self-control become a new show window for the good citizen crystallizing in middle-class affluent performances that cast the working classes or the poorer countries as trashy. 
and in any case, less cap capable of environmental action. So this approach, of course, distracts our attention from communal acts of environmentalism or environmentalism as a matter of necessity, which is the examples that we really see in a lot of political ecology work that has engaged with real action on the ground. So it reduces environmentalism to a problem of shame, creating new lacks in our personalities and behaviors. So these shaming restrictive narratives that dominate the mainstream environmental action are produced the very mechanisms of environmental destruction and find mm. new ways of consuming to dig our way out of the environmental crisis. But environmentalism is not a matter of austerity, but a matter of excess. And it's a matter of recognizing our engagements with matter and recognizing matter as desire, as desiring. So we are not the only ones that desire, everything desires around us. Like Karen Barat uh, has these ideas about matter as something that feels, converses, suffers, desires, yearns, and remembers. And this idea resonates with the possibility of encountering surprise in any responses of climate change that actually represent the direct engagement with attempts to change the matter of the world. If matter also desires, then the question is not just what I desire as an individual, but what is the collective desire, how we can achieve it through our entanglements with the materials and ecologies around us. Is there a true, uh, this is uh, near my village in the Pyrenees, that's where I was born, around there. So is there a true alternative in communal environmental justice narratives of environmental action? So in her masterful analysis of the production of irony as a form of environmentalism, Jane Seymour uh, mocks attempts at constructing environmental virtues and explains the importance of the short of trashy environmentalism which she locates in working class communities whose effects relate to vulgarity and shamelessness. So for me, it's impossible not to read this through the prism of my own family experience in the north of Spain, whose village trashiness was exposed during Francois fascist times by the engineers and territorial planners who label us as non-modern to empty our territory. Yeah, this is a territory which of course I have now abandoned. Today, those territories of my childhood are invaded by, la by large renewable companies that make a virtue of sacrificing territory to facilitate externally imposed models of renewable virtue. So two years ago, I found that there is a proposal to install a solar park near my town that will lead to further disaffection and migration among the population that remains there. So mine is an empty country, a country of non-modernity in which the development of middle-class effects that Seymour criticizes provokes a sense of loss and shame. And you see there some of the signs of the protests. But then there are also reasons for optimism, right? In the interim, the local government of that place is called uh, uh, the town of Haka, was able to stop the macro park development. And like in other detailed areas, the communities, uh, the villages around it, they have come together to form their own solar communities and some of them are thriving. So out of the external imposition has emerged a different alternative. These energy communities emerge out of the need to seduce each other. So back to Lauren Berlin, she places the possibility of a kind of philosophical pragmatism that involves becoming a political subject whose solidarities and commitments are neither to ends nor to imagine the pragmatics of a consensual community, but to embody processes of making solidarity. Okay, there are so many chairs there, please, you can go. Okay, uh, so Lauren Berlin is always like a little bit like confusing, <laughs> but uh, basically uh, 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 this is about, uh, uh, they are speaking about becoming a political subject. And so that the solidarity built across these collectives is not towards a particular end of addressing climate change, but it's about maintaining and reproducing those processes of making solidarity and challenging the environment in which we are. And this is really what I find lacking in climate politics. I move away from objectives and from holding hands to engage instead in an ongoing process of reconstruction, 
in which there is no other end than activating solidarities. Politics is thus located in the present activities of the sense, on the, of the senses, in aesthetic and affective positions beyond the ordinary normal. If the Anthropocene has disrupted our sense of normality, the objective of the lateral politics that Berlant is arguing for is not to reconstruct it. We are not going back to that normality. We need to find the means to create a process of constant reparation and meaningful engagements that can help reimagine solidarity in terms of crisis without universalizing. In the same way, Jane Seymour asked what it would mean to leave behind the effects of obligation, shame, and conscription to focus instead on enticement, seduction, and fun as the basis for environmental movements, which is exactly what these energy communities in Spain are trying to do. They are trying to seduce each other and to say, maybe we can do this together. So in climate urbanism, this, mean, this entails engaging with the effects constructed through the everyday experiences of cities in a form of urbanism that I like to call reparative. As building on others. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was time and this idea of chrononormativities. And so back to the Anthropocene as an existential challenge, challenge, we have to think about it as strongly intertwined with conceptions of time. So there's obviously a, a narrative that links the Anthropocene with the past, the histories that shape the present moment. So when we talk about climate or carbon colonialism, we are talking about the history of climate change and how it's embedded in our histories. There is a narrative that links the Anthropocene with the future in terms of the uh, unimaginable, imaginable, and unimaginable consequences associated to climate change. Why do I do this to myself as I write the most difficult words <laughs> and then I cannot pronounce them? And finally, there is the present. And the present climate change is urgency, right? It's a crisis, it's like emergency. One way in which queer theory can help rethink these time assumptions embedded in current climate poli policy and to think of alternatives that generate the lateral politics that Berlang was talking about is noticing how different lives unfold at different times. Queer theory has ch challenged the idea of heteronormative spaces and how they condition life uh, and how life depends on chrononormativities that structure time in relation to the demands of capitalism and heteronormative societies. And that's why I put the picture there about maybe when those chrononormativities may, became, uh, may have become generalized in the UK. So for Elizabeth Freeman and other queer theories, the study of queer temporalities provides a point of entry to examine how these chrononormativities, these ideas about how time has to be, actually structure time. And in doing so, they condition our responses to the world changing around us. So one of the critical perspectives on these chrononormativities uh, would entail examine how climate, the climate crisis has been shaped by the rhythms of capitalism, how they orient who do, what we do and who we are. So our everyday ex existence is dominated by capitalist temporalities since the Industrial Revolution, perhaps, and is punctuated by the routines that enroll our labor in the capitalist system. Our life is also punctuated by the cyclical temporalities of the home, care, and labor that it entails, separating work and care. These chrononormativities recruit us into the ecocidal racial capitalism and shape our fundamental conditions of existence. And this could be developed itself in a, theory, in, in a theoretical kind of challenge to how those rhythms of, of everyday living kind of shape what we do in terms of carbon emissions and in terms of being able to adapt to climate change. But at the same time, these chrononormativities shape how we think about our action in the world. So we don't think that about our action in the world through those rhythms, but in fact, we navigate history through notions of monumental time, the events of historical significance in which we encounter different types of heroes. So monumental time streamlines time into a linear narrative of background action, which is punctuated by monumental moments in which some form of heroic action is performed. 
So the Anthropocene disrupts this narrative of monumental time, not questioning it fundamentally, but extending it in time, in, into geological time, what is called deep time. So the, the scales of deep time become a kind of a, a unconceivable in relation to the scales of human life, whether this is industrial time or the more cyclical rhythms of home. So we kind of disconnect the way we experience time in our everyday life, following the capitalist rhythms, from the way time is perceived historically over very long periods of time. And then we completely uh, fail to understand how we can intervene into that process. And if we think about the, whether we can intervene, we always imagine it as a heroic intervention. So the scale of action to generate monumental events in deep time is even greater from a linear conception of history, the collective unification of the whole of humanity and the leadership of global leaders as the prescription. And it appears almost as like a new religion whose priests are in search of new saviors and saviors. And you wonder if they will find them in the cop in Dubai next month. That was a joke. In monumental time, there is no time for everyday gestures, for collective solidarities built through affective practices of care, or space for the accidental encounters that produce pleasure and affiliation. So there are a lot of alternative ways in which we can think about time. So maybe different ways in which we could build a revolutionary time, and perhaps they could not relate to either this form of thinking, the rhythms of life through capitalism, but they can also not go to the linear con conception of time that emphasizes monumental time. So just an, as an example, building on indigenous imaginaries, uh, Kyle Powis White, uh, has, who is an indigenous scholar, has described the potentialities of kinship time or kin time, where time is navigated not as a succession of events, but as a series of kinship bonds where the rhythms are punctuated actually by those structures of kin that make our affective life meaningful. For White, is it is important to highlight that those relations of kin are not necessarily familiar ties, but rather ties to humans and non-humans that entail care and responsibility uh, for each other. So I'm not arguing to just reproduce the structure of the family in another way. Time becomes what that which we do together no, no monumental events, but the caring and the collective and the solidarity of events that include ecological and material kinship ties. And here I go back to Karen Barat's Desiring Mother and the way that is also enrolled in our forms of kinship time. So those who have ever taken seriously the politics of participation, activism and community organizing, they may recognize this, they may recognize the affective experience of this kinship time in which energy and personal growth are tied to collective action. It is as it were the possibility of creating new forms of desire for moments of collective engagement in which mutual histories are interwoven into a rich tapestry of stories and interpretations to challenge monumental events. So for me, a kinship time challenges directly this idea of capitalist rhythms that is kind of a structure our, our life into timetables and everybody running in London. I mean, I came here running and I, th I thought it was very fast, but everybody was faster than me. So if we are going to rethink the conception of time for revolutionary action, and if capitalism relies on quantifiable expropriated segments of abstract time that you can structure in this linear time, Moving outside capitalism will require constructing multiple alternatives of personhood that resist the imposition of these normalized timings. And keen time may be one of the ways to do so. We cannot stop history, right? We cannot stop that monumental time invading our lives. I mean, I'm, many of us are feeling this these days, right, with the conflict in the Middle East, but, uh, but with the situation in Palestine. But uh, we cannot stop history, but perhaps history at least is open to certain playfulness. If we are able to find pleasure in certain moments, and if we are able to link those moments with the subversion of chrononormativities, those moments may generate new desires and different collective futures. But for the most time, 
the conceptions of time in environmental movements, such as Extinction Rebellion, remain stuck in monumental time and in heroic narratives that are counterproductive in the development of collective solidarities of the Anthropocene. So the focus is on policymakers and fossil fuel companies, and they are supposed to be our heroes. No, it's not going to happen like that, right? So it's a, that contradictory sense of fun and playfulness of making routine rather than a heroic events that has conferred energy to youth-led climate movements that are now changing the face of climate politics. And I think it's there where I find most of the hope and where I find there a lot of uh, strategies for action that directly change the normativities we live through. So this is a photo of an event I attended a couple of years ago, and that was an alternative event to the COP and involved uh, hundreds of teenagers, mostly female, in Glasgow debating what was a generational climate politics? What did a generational climate politics uh, involve? Because the examination of chrononormativities also forces us to look at the politics of social change over time. And in the context of climate change, of sustainability and environmental change, the idea of future generations has shaped the discourse since the 1980s. The Anthropocene has only intensified these discourses in terms of situating us as future ancestors, saving the planet for future generations. So part of the potency of youth-led social movements such as Fridays for the Future has precisely been the focus on the, on the future. But I think they have challenged this narrative of being the future ancestor. There is little reflection on the fact that future generations may offer not attachment to current middle-class values and that their desired future may be entirely different from the one we live in. But most importantly, from a queer theory perspective, these gestures of grand history, a heroic portrayal of a generation committed to the mission of creating a better future, generate a strong sense of skepticism, particularly insofar as it depends on a logic of generational reproduction that does not sit well with queer performativity. So the performance of family the, uh, depends on the timing of events and, and activities around the dinner table, around the life course, around the conception of the self. It's not dissimilar of the performance of nationhood or identity and how they become essentialized in, in relation to perceived opposites, opposites whether it's non-family members, foreigners or migrants. So the timing in family and generational performances appears to consolidate collective life, but the coherence it provides, as Elizabeth Freeman has argued, is fragile. Invoking such solidarities in climate policy debates overlooks that people operate through multiple attachments and senses of belonging, which the conventional model of family or generation are only examples rather than norms. So climate, Action cannot be predicated on the argument of being a good ancestor and securing an inheritance and legacy for future generations, because neither the earth is ours to give, nor we can predict the kind of environment in which future generations will want to live. We want to constitute ourselves as generational heroes, fixing the monumental events of the future. Yet our duty is elsewhere. The call we are hearing is not to save the world, but to prevent further damage to it. So to conclude, Anna Singh has argued that we already live in the precarious winds of capitalism, where people and things live immersed in complex relations of reciprocity. There is no grand historical narrative, only lessons to learn about how to live with both economic and ecological ruination, rather than restoring a lost ideal archaic Arcadia or reconnecting with a self-regulating Gaia. We need to learn to live in the world we are in. As we recognize the ground we live, is as unstable, we should not double down our illusions of control and extend them to nature as well. Instead, we must engage with the realities of Earth. As Bruno Latour has said, there is no cure for the condition of belonging to the world. There's no cure. Instead, we can draw maybe hope or maybe this hope from the possibility of living through multiple times while recognizing our role in making the landscapes we live in as this challenges the heroic generation narrative, because it is not for us to provide children with a safe earth. Instead, 
children are already claiming their rights and our implication and responsibilities in an ongoing crisis. So thank you. And now what do I do, David? Thanks very much, Vanessa. Is this Thank you very much? Um, cool. I'll join you up here. Thank you for an incredibly rich and super theoretically like engaging presentation. Um, yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, no, thanks for that, Ben. Um, so just for those of you that are joining us online, um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A. Um, I'll start before I take kind of chair's leave of, of questions. Um, I'd like to open up to the floor for any questions from the audience that's with us in the room. Yeah, at the back. But, um, thank you. Talk. Um, really we just need to press it once so that it's green, and then is that right? Yeah. Okay. I can work again on the chrono normative. And the busyness productivity around that which i feel is quite scary at the same time i wonder if it plays into a narrative to do nothing i wonder about do so i just i wonder how do you kind of between that sort of double consciousness around where where that can take you, I just wondered about that. How how to sit with that? Does it mean that you have to go towards a sort of pleasure for? Yeah, I'm just interested in how you sit with that discomfort querying around time. Mm -hmm. So do I answer directly, or you, do I answer directly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Great. Um, so um, I assume what's going on. Uh, about the, uh, so I didn't continue, but my final part of the presentation, which I didn't do, was like about my response to it. But I, I actually think the opposite. I think I think two things. <laughs> One is that a lot of people do a lot of things that would contribute to climate uh, to uh, uh, clim uh, that we could call climate change action. And uh, um, and we've we've recorded uh, my team and I we've recorded and work every day to record them, but they are not necessarily celebrated and accounted for. So that's one thing. Uh, and I think rethinking, for example, the kind of notion of keen time that Kyle Paul's White is arguing for is precisely to celebrate those kinds of actions. And uh, maybe this is like a bit of a very kind of uh, absurd example, but I, I I really like in that movie, Don't Look Up with Leonardo DiCaprio, maybe some of you have seen about this uh, meteorite is going to come to the earth and nobody does anything. And those who do, they, they do a lot of monumental things, a lot of mon monumental time things, a lot of heroic action, but nothing really. Uh, in the end, what the Leonardo DiCaprio, as the hero of the, like, the superhero and the hero of the story does, is like, being with the family, right? And I mean, not to defend the figure of the family, but it's like the everydayness of the response and the fact that you already can do something on your everydayness and kind of in that in that case, because they are going to die and it, and they know that. In our case, perhaps uh, climate change is something that through that everydayness we can shift and perhaps we can see differently. And then finally, so that will be one, two, and the final response will be is that climate change is already changing our lives and um, probably everybody life, everybody's life here. In particular, climate change is changing the lives of those who are already suffering a lot and who are already at the receiving end of injustice in the world. 
And just for example, as an example, we've done a survey with uh, 300 voice speakers in Belo Horizonte and they, Brazil. And uh, we've discovered through this survey that almost 90% of them have experienced a climate change related impact in the last six months. Some of them more, some of them have experienced. So, I mean, the, the way is changing our societies is already happening. So what we have is a lot of people repairing the relationship, learning to live with those massive changes and learning to understand how we can cope with it. And that's also part of it. It's not just reducing emissions, that, which is super important. And you know that every fraction of temperature, uh, every fraction that the temperature increases reduces our capacity to adapt to so that, that, that dual relationship that we cannot escape. But at the same time, those actions for adaptation are also very important, and they actually relate with those very important ties of kin and these forms of understanding time as the as the moment in which we all come together. Yeah, so I don't know, maybe that responds to your question. It's a great question, love it. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, in summary, action is already happening. Uh, let's account for it. Uh, Let's think about the types of action that really make a difference and how they make a difference. And finally, let's think about how action for adaptation is what is happening. So that's a summary. I think it's run out of buttons. This sounds like something. Ah, huh. yes, Hello? this sounds like it's working. Um, I was wondering about hierarchies and, you know, the old school patriarchal pyramid with the leader on the top, which our society seems to really value because then it's easier to digest information if you've got like the leaders of the movement, say, speak on behalf of their movement, which is usually how discourses had no but if we want to break that way of thinking about how we how we work together as humans um it's how do you think that can be navigated so as soon as somebody speaks up and says i think we should do this differently they're suddenly the leader of the queer people and everybody wants to interview them on behalf of everybody else and then it's broken no is there a way to kind of be in the space and invite more people into that debate without them being pushed into those roles that we're trying to kind of deteriorate or, or you know what I mean like mm. suddenly you're out there and you're them yeah so for example uh, Greta Thunberg her, herself uh, asked a million times not to be asked again because there were other people to be asked but um so there are two things there I can say one they are different one is that the notion of the this notion of the leader the leader becomes important only in monumental time no as the person who makes the decision as say is actually also like a particular form of leadership that is the uh, like as as leadership is like being decisive and taking decisions. Whereas in fact, management consultants and business leaders and so on, they would tell you oh, what we should do is to have a more transformative form of leadership from vulnerability and so on. So I only know because training leadership training from the university. So leadership that are actually implemented by people who start in leadership from the narratives of leadership that we tell in kind of climate politics and the narrative of leadership that is uh, performed by the press and the media. I mean, and it's incredible how the press and the media um, sell us a certain notion. But anyway, this is not exactly what you ask. What you ask is like, if somebody is put up to be a leader, uh, how, how we can avoid that they, they have to take the responsibility. And I think thinking of the temporarily important and thinking about when is the moment I can make a difference and when is the moment I can withdraw is important from a personal point of view and from a personal of the relationships I establish. So I've mentioned Karen, ba Karen Barrett because it influenced me a lot when I wrote a book on, on landscapes. And the reason why I was in the, very interested in the notion of landscapes is because I was thinking about how change happens in within particular environments, their surroundings that shape our relationships. And um, what 
what Karen Barada explains with these notions of design matter, that our capacity to influence our surroundings, what we conventionally call as the notion of agency, doesn't depend, it's not something that is located in any one of us or in any one thing. It's something that is always shared. It's always embedded in a relationship. So when you are a leader, you have to recognize that that leadership belongs to that relationship. So that can recognizing that form of influence in the middle, I think it's really important. And actually, when you see how people inhabit the world, many people just live through that in their lives. Yeah, you were, yeah I was in there. There we go. Um, yeah, I, I, actually, thinking about Occupy and the way it operated also was a kind of different model of leadership because the press was always looking for, you know, who's your leader, who's your spokesperson? And they're like, we're not doing that. What we're doing is we're living the future we want to see mm -hmm. together. So you just have to watch us. Um, and and that, th that was kind of a mess. It was kind of a beautiful mess, and and what I wanted to ask you about was the was the notion of mess mess because it seems to me there's very much an ecological sensibility there because I couldn't help thinking about Joan Iverson Nassauer's essay on um, messy ecosystems but mm -hmm. putting them in orderly frames. Um, so is is that the way that you're using the idea of, of mess? Is that about a willingness to lower yourself into a situation and live in the moment, live amidst the mess. Um, uh, Warren Johnson talked about this in his book, um, Muddling Towards Frugality, where, where he's like, you just have to kind of get down into it and live it. Is is that the kind of thing you're speaking about when you're... Yeah, you're probably identifying some influences on me, but um, probably the, the first time probably I thought about mess as... Um, as a characteristic of governance was when I read those essays, uh, now I don't remember the others, but on planning and muddling through, and the fact that a lot of the planning is muddling through. And um, I, I was never quite convinced because obviously with planning, it's all about creating this kind of plan and creating some form of rationality or yeah, communicative rationality, whatever. But uh, um, I, I think that's the first time when I started to think about it. Um, the fact that the way we engage with our own rationalities may be just a way of constructing um, a narrative for what in fact is a process of trying to bring things, assembling things. Then when I move into thinking about transitions, uh, how a process of radical change happens in society, particularly in relation to this technology, then I, I realized that that was the only way to look at, at it. That there was no kind of where you can identify that trajectory whereby that happens. So normally when you have a transition, um, uh, people think it's A to B and then you follow this path to A to B. And for example, the notion of pathways is something that has come from the Bartlett planning about how path pathways for low carbon transitions and Yvonne Reddy, uh, Yvonne Reddy and other people have led that research. But actually for me, the transitions I studied myself and I look historically at different cities, how they had changed over time. Uh, you suddenly are in a place and then you suddenly are in another. And the way that has happened, who knows? It happened through the million of interactions. And that's really very difficult to explain in terms of policy or something, but that's really how things happen. The ecological influence is also there because uh, well, it was my first degree, right? And it's really important for us to realize that uh, but thinking a relationship with ecosystems and with the, with ecology is crucial. Is perhaps the most important thing we have to do, apart from addressing equality, inequalities in terms of dealing with climate change. And one interesting thing is that when we think, in fact, I, I've used the word ecosystems. I really don't like it because that suggests that the ecosystem is something that is organized and flows. Uh, uh, I don't know nutrients sunlight and water and you name it and everything becomes organized in a wonderful circle. Of course, there's plenty of empirical evidence. Okay. Ecosystems, ecosystems work in very messy ways. And you can identify certain causal relations that 
they change over time. And imagine with climate change, this is all coming under pressure. So I think the kind of cutting edge thinking in ecology, I think it's really informative and really useful to think about messiness. But I would always warn ourselves against using ecological metaphors into the, as a person who early in my career studied urban metabolism quite in depth. <laughs> and perhaps uh, it's, it's maybe useful sometimes, but maybe it's not always useful. There was a, you had a question. No, oh, I said you had a question. Hi, uh, thank you. I was really struck by uh, that notion of uh, keen time and kinship because that's not my thing. Um, and as you were talking about it, I was also thinking about that nice uh, slogan that Donna Haraway talks about, make kin, not babies, mm -hmm. which sort of goes back all the way in a way to evil man and no future and all that. And I was wondering if the way you think about kin time in relation to your work uh, encompasses the possibility, because when she's talking about making kin, she's also talking about making kin outside of what we normally consider as a human, so a different form of kinship and so on. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you think that that notion of kin time could be extended or could be a way for us to take into account non-human times. I mean, I know I'm opening a complicated box by using the word human, but non-human time or, or you know, breaking free from the bond of humanistic thinking in relation to time and how that might be useful um, when we think about um, working yeah. on climate change. And, and yeah, totally, totally. So uh, I don't know, I haven't mentioned Donna Haraway because I thought there were just too many people already. <laughs> but uh, yes, of course, this influenced uh, me, me a lot. Um, but I would say Kyle Poe is white notion of kin time. It does not come from discussions with uh, uh, with uh, Donna Haraway or with any other authors like that, because it really comes from indigenous thought. And I think it's important, though the words are similar and the concepts are similar, I think it's important to kind of show what is this part of indigenous thought that is inspiring us so that we don't appropriate it in an extracted in ways that suits us it's because it resonates with Donna Haraway. So I think it's very specific to the notion, to the to the way we think about ourselves in the world, and in fact, there have been so, uh, some nice essays about uh, the fact that, for example, indigenous peoples may understand, you know, uh, thinking of Kelpo is why 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 it's work. Uh, they may think themselves through the land, and they may think themselves in specific relations that I don't think they are contained within Donna Haraway's philosophy. But obviously, Donna Haraway's philosophy is so open that is always very inspiring and useful and her notion of making healing is also very interesting and and resonates with a lot of this work yeah yeah can pose by the emphasize that land and ecology is a very strong part of what, what we think through but he laments this kind of loss of that form of relationship in which those encounters shape people's lives and help them imagine their futures in different ways. So, uh, for example, one of the things that he and other indigenous scholars say is that indigenous peoples, particularly in North America, well, in other you know, places, but they, they were... Um, they flee through the apocalypse, right? so they, they through the and now they have actually survived the apocalypse, so, or partially survived the apocalypse. So this is how they look. So what, what he argues is, what we are living today is the dystopia of our ancestors. So how are we going to be now the good ancestor who is going to live a wonderful planet for future generations? I mean, will the future generations, I don't know, enjoy a wonderful world of social media, deep fakes, artificial intelligence, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure, some, some bits of our life are already, already quite dystopian. So the question, what bits of our lives are not dystopians? What bits of our lives are the ones that we want to preserve? And can we repair them? And can we work towards repairing? I mean, and, and you see a lot of forms of reparation uh, happening in our contemporary cities every day and um, happening and in places where you shouldn't have people living. They live actually wonderful, rich, and um, beautiful lives. And, and yes, yeah. And I think that's important to celebrate and to 
kind of uh, not thinking that my life is going to be defined by, I don't know, I don't want to say anybody, but like by somebody who's not going to pay any attention about what matters to me and to my relations and to my encounters. Yeah, great question. Great question, actually. I was wondering if you could speak a bit about like methodology because that's I'm always trying to translate um I think that's a big interest of mine within this series actually is like thinking through like queer theory as like a method and queer thought as a method and I think you've given us some really interesting entry points there but just for you personally like how have you found um or maybe for for both academics and researchers and activists and like community-based organizers like who want to engage more with kin time or with um this this notion of like reparative urbanism that that you've introduced us to how like do you have any tips for how you might do that and I think you've given a segue into that through like desire and rethinking time but on like practically how how have you been able to embed that in the work that you were doing in various types of projects or policy arenas? Well, uh, first, not very well. <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, so th maybe that's why my talk is so theoretical is because uh, I'm still trying to think. Uh, so as I, I've explained a little bit, maybe temporarily, I don't know if it was clear, but when I wrote that essay on messiness in 2018, I that's when I started to think, and when I engaged first with uh, Karen Barrett and Donna Haraway, only then I started to think, oh my God, this thing of queer theory is really important. And so I'm really working through the theory and trying to see how to apply it, apart from different engagements in which I see, oh my God, this is, I have something to say. So for example, um, Ben mentioned that essay I wrote on queer participatory planning. And I mean, it's really interesting that, that maybe that contributes something to queer theory. I, I don't think so. I think mostly what I tried to do was to bring queer theory to participation because I thought it could help me imagine and think about um, radical inclusion as a principle for participation, which is what they say does. And it's for radical inclusion. Not everybody agrees with it. So it's only really in the last two or three years that I've been trying to do empirical work with queer theory. So last year, for example, um, we did this study with Guillermo Delgado in Namibia. Um, I, like, I don't like to go to new countries because I feel always disoriented, but he was very keen to work with me on this. And we work with, we partner with this organization that had never looked at housing and resilience housing in, uh, in, in there. And, and we did these workshops and so in, in terms of methodology, it, it was quite difficult. And I think you can only do it with activist organizations that already understand the difficulties of doing this kind of research. So I think it's very difficult. And I think maybe it's not always possible to focus on the queer aspect that you have to focus on broader aspects and see whether you have this a lot about what is overlooked. What is overlooked, no? What is le left behind, which is what queer theory forces us to do to look to that which is not been examined or not seen, or to look to that that is not, not that is escapes the norm or that is oppressed and challenged by the norm. Look beyond the notions of order and so on. And, and then the other thing we've been trying, I say with we because it's a team because it's a big endeavor, we've, we've been trying to see if this notion of reparative of action brings us a different way of uh, climate, climate action. So whether we can use queer theory to a different way of looking at climate action. It's really annoying to say. Well, this is better. Oh, this is a bit better, right? So, so if we think about reparative action, how can we define it in relation to other forms of action? So, what I would call a business as usual action. That would be one type of action. And then we will have a disruptive action that will be action that is trying to change things, right? And actually, I think the Bartlett is a place 
downstairs in a poster. So maybe disruption is not something that is very far from you. So if you have business as usual and disruptive action as a dichotomy, but actually that misses all the come out of reparative action. So we, we've been trying to understand if reparative action actually takes place. So that, that's the question. And in that sense, it's maybe not different from looking at other forms of theory, but just defining codes. So we've collected more than 150 projects and we've examined them in relation of whether they have any evidence of reparative innovation. And we find, and this is only in reparative secondary cities, overlooked cities uh, in West Africa, East Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia. We find that about a quarter of actions have a reparative element. Half of them are business as usual, right? So um, I think it's quite interesting just to show that something is possible, something different is possible and trying to find what are the elements of that of that what is possible but yeah i think the methodology you could write a book is there not a book on queer methodologies i think there is right <laughs> so maybe so, thanks for that vanessa are there any other questions in the audience yeah, yeah i totally feel i made that up jordana sorry <laughs> thanks a lot for for your Words, uh, I think that is really interesting to connect emotions, discourses and climate action and environment and how we, that is like in the mainstream discourses is really connected with shame and with pain and how like in the other side, it can be connected with love, with joy. So in that sense, I was thinking maybe how can we connect climate actions with mental health issues mm -hmm. and healing related with mental health? I don't know if you... Yeah, I mean, that's as far from my expertise as I can imagine, but uh, well, if, if I have any expertise, but uh, I, I, as far of any space that I feel comfortable because I really cannot say a lot, but the only thing I can say is that climate change is um, there's plenty of evidence that is linked with a decline in mental health. So certainly climate action has to be linked to that. And there's a concept called solastalgia. Have you heard of that? Yeah, it's a, a deep sadness, which could be transformed into depression, which is particularly felt by uh, the Inuit, or at least it's been recorded among the Inuit in the North Pole. And it's caused by the perception of change in the environment due to climate change. So there's like a specific problem that is related to climate change only. So I think, yeah, th that connection has to be there. And let's don't forget that a lot of climate actions in urban environments, and I, mean, I haven't had the time to talk about that, but a lot of the climate actions in urban environments, they are precisely good actions because they have a range of other co-benefits. So you don't do anything just to reduce carbon emissions or improve resilience, but you do actions that have a wide range of benefits and health benefits. Uh, yeah. For example, if we talk about greening cities and growing forests, this is something that directly and indirectly can be related to our mental health. But uh, yeah, it's not something I've looked in any detail, but thank you, it's a great question. I bet somebody's there answering it. <laughs> Yeah, it strikes me that that form of celebration might be different than like the way that we, if we start to embrace or experience more of this kin time, then the way that we presumably need to celebrate that may become different because we may not be orientated towards a spectacle or towards an individual kind of output. It's There may be a really interesting way that we feel that change, maybe. I just wanted to say like, it's been really useful to think about kin time I hadn't thought about it ever and it made me think of the different forms of protest that I've been to recently but it's actually left me really confused it's like it's kind of like a monumental kin time right because you're in these spaces where you're developing these new relationships or you're finding these new constraints and opportunities of these people that you're interacting with but you're right in the middle of monumental time especially when you're in a train station and in a way, that's what made them so powerful is when people were making these kind of kin actions, like cheering when everyone sits down together in a train station 
So these two kind of times are kind of mashing up against one another. And it, yeah, I just wondered, maybe it's just, those are kind of like heightened kin times, but they're more like dream images. They're not like real kin. I guess maybe you're asking us to celebrate these more everyday mm-hmm. forms of kin time that are not so heightened in a way. It's more like yeah, maybe very I'm not quiet engaging. everyday life. Like, so but, uh, I thought your observations were absolutely very interesting. Uh, thank you for them. Um, it's fascinating. But I imagine, I don't think I'm saying anything about what time actually is, but about how ta- how time, how we understand time and live through time in the way that makes sense to us. So it's only about how you think of that narrative of that experience that you are having. And you can adopt any of these narratives, right? In any in any moment. So the, in the moments of your life, you can kind of structure in the way you see it. Uh, so yes, I think I imagine those conception of time, those conceptions of time are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, but uh, I mean, putting it like that so beautifully as you have, I think it's quite useful. Thank you. Hi, Vanessa. Thanks very much for a really stimulating talk. Um, I have a question that's formulating around shame. Um, and I'm thinking that some of the ideas that you talk about with queer time um, or that you're drawing upon come from kind of an activism against being shamed, being around HIV AIDS in the 80s and 90s, um, and also with this kind of relationship between the activism and theory, there was a very active use of shame against institutions. Um, and I think shame is, you know, it's really bound into queer politics, the queer queer social movements. Um, so I take it from your uh, talk that you're critical of, sh- of shame as a kind of um, mode of climate uh, in, in relation to uh, climate activism, because that's placing shame on individuals. Um, but I just wondered if you had any more thoughts really on, on shame in activism, and particularly in queer activism, because it's, it's in a way it's quite hard to imagine from my view of uh, queer politics, that politics without a lot of virtue signaling and shaming actually within and across um, different movements, but also still a very active use of shame in as a campaigning or as a kind of tactic in mm-hmm. relation to, to institutions. I just wonder if you had any more thoughts um, expanding yeah. on your ideas about and, shame. And equally, it's difficult to not shame fossil fuel companies, right? So, I mean, there's, there's no... So Jane Seymour doesn't argue that shame is something that we should totally rule from our lives, but it just shouldn't be the only effect of our activism in environment. And this is also in the case of the HIV AIDS crisis. Yes, okay, at some point institutions were shame, but it came rather late. And all the time, the individuals were also shame. So the shame effect, I don't think that was positive at all. And um, so maybe we have to kind of embrace the limits of shame. So in my own experience, I, I see that there's shame leads to kind of the exclusion of those forms of action that don't fit the kind of virtuous circle. I mean, if you want to be vegan, be vegan. I mean, it's great. I mean, I think vegan is healthier and yeah. And if you want to reduce, I'm reducing my travel because of my shame, eh, because I think, I don't think those are bad things. I'm just thinking it's misdirecting the attention to the actual important places where change is actually going to come from. And perhaps I would argue that in the HIV AIDS crisis, the collective effort of organizing, this is maybe what Eve Kosowski said, we argues herself in her essay on this topic, um, the effort of organizing it, the effort of supporting each other, the effort of building solidarities, the effort of having my door open they were more important than the shaming. At least they, they were the preconditions for that shaming of institutions to happen, I think. But yeah, maybe a historian of the of that particular protest would be better qualified than me to answer that. But it's a great question. Thank you. And a great comparison, by the way. Yeah, between the, that crisis and this one. 
Hi, uh, thanks so much for the talk. And um, I really enjoyed the images of Hakka. <laughs> Are you from Hakka? <laughs> I'm not, but it really resonated with very similar protests around um, wind farms where I'm from in Galicia. Oh, okay. And I think I wanted to get, sorry if it's, it's quite a local thing to ask, but I wanted to get your view of what role do you think those landscapes of what we now call the España Vaciada? Mm -hmm. What role those landscapes and those communities uh, you think they play in the in the climate politi politics that you suggest? Yeah. So the España Vaciada is the product of shame, right? We were all shame out of our villages. We were shame for the languages we spoke there. We were shame for not having the proper attitude towards modernity. Uh, my grandfather was shame for not having the right agricultural skills until he went to the city, right, to work at uh, some kind of random job. Um, so I think uh, it's a sad history that we've had in terms of the imposition of, of external projects. So a lot of some theories in Spain, and you must know this, uh, they've talked about endogenous colonialism. So the way certain regions in Spain exploited others and emptied them. And what is happening today is that those macro developments are happening precisely in the same places, precisely because they were already shamed, so they can be shamed again. So it is really sad. And it is complex because what is what is happening for those of you who maybe not, not known, maybe not very interested on this, but, um, what this has led to is uh, like I would say, a very difficult alliance of a lot of people in those kind of try to reclaim their identities and their ways of being, but in some places aligning themselves with extreme right positions. I don't know if that's what is happening in Galicia, is what is happening in, in the place where I'm from. So looking for effective alternatives that are building in other kind of values is urgent in these communities. It's urgent because the growth of extreme right in Spain is grounded precisely on this process. And I mean, the kind of queer effects that uh, I've described, I think they're extremely important there. We shouldn't think that people in these communities are doing nothing. So as I say, I'm from a, I was born in Jaca, but in a very small village uh, called Bailo. And um, my, my friends there, they've come together to this association. And like I went, I saw some of their meetings online and I've tried to follow it online and they're really like seduction meetings in which there's a lot of coming, oh, yeah, we are going to do this energy community, it's going to be something completely different, we are going to do it together, la 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 la. It's, it's really a new way of building community and a new way of finding new forms of seduction through the solar energy at a much lower scale. So uh, for me, that's the future the local future is one modular, decentralized, of grid, but unfortunately, the models of universalizing infrastructure models, the modern infrastructure ideal still holds strong in the imagination of Spain's policymakers and policymakers everywhere, actually. Thank you. Thank you for the Spanish question. Great. <laughs> But in a moment of poly crisis or climate crisis um, that we find ourselves in, what does it mean to you? Like, if you had to prioritize like one thing or a couple of things, what does it mean to clear urbanism in a moment of climate crisis that we've been discussing over the course of two months? So if I can only choose one thing, I would choose like let's learn to particularly here, design and imagine cities in which love and place prioritize over everything else. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, if you all I think uh, just watch the space for the next video.
silly. I don't think there's anything on the website yet, but if you do go to the, the website to be clear, there's now a mailing list, so you can sign up for that and you'll receive the emails from Lowe when we know about it. Yeah. There's definitely going to be one next spring. And also, if anyone has ideas for that, because of a bunch of really good pieces, then please let us get in touch with us or you want to help organize them. And I'm sorry, it's open. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you. 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 Thank you